Good evening, everybody, and a uh, very special uh, welcome to our men's conference, uh, Soldiers for Mary. And uh, we're thrilled we're here. We're in uh, the heart of Dublin 7, in the Legion of Mary uh, HQ. And it seems quite appropriate to have a Soldiers for Mary uh, in Legion HQ, given that uh, legionaries, well, the Roman legionaries were considered an elite fighting force. So we're, I suppose we're setting our standards very high, but shalom, August Foilshit to everybody. So tonight, uh, we're actually joined as well by uh, Sister Mary Murphy, who's the president of um, the, the Legion Concilium, so which is the, the governing council of the Legion worldwide. So, and a special thank you as well for giving us permission to be here. So at this point, I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Sean Grace, who's an active legionary, and he's going to lead us uh, in prayers, the opening prayers of the Legion Tessera and also the, the Rosary. So, Brother Sean, you're very welcome. Hey. O oh God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal salvation, grant, we beseech you, that meditating upon these mysteries, the most holy rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, Amen. immaculate heart of Mary, St. Joseph, Saint John the Evangelist, Saint Louis Marie de Montfort. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Back to you, Emmanuel. Sean, uh, thank you for leading the prayers there. And uh, I was just struck. It's um, for people who are tuning into this. Uh, I was really struck by the, the power of men praying the Rosary. And that's not to take away from you, Sister Mary, but. Uh, yeah, but it, no, it just reminded me of my first visit to the Morning Star Hostel, and I'd never been to a Legion meeting. I actually hadn't any kind of concept or clue about the Legion, but I remember being struck by going, being brought into the oratory, and there was all men, and we're praying the Rosary in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I just found it like a, a kind of a, a stunning moment. Like it's kind of it's just impacted really deeply into me because I'd never heard men really pray the Rosary with such kind of reverence and. There was a kind of a real sense of strength, and it was something that we commented on earlier this evening. Uh, the legendary uh, Brother Anto is with us this evening, a uh, great uh, legionary from uh, Croatia. Great to have you with us, Anto. And we were talking, because we prayed the rosary on the street tonight in Dublin, how, you know, something about men praying the rosary together, because I, I don't know about how you, how the brothers in the room feel here, but sometimes it's a struggle when we pray on our own. But I think, Sean, it was just, you led it so well, and just the way everybody responded. So there's a real sense of potential here this evening. And this is a really exciting project. I can't stress this enough. Uh, I joined, I've, I've come to this very late, by the way, but I joined the planning meeting last night, and I was saying to Brother Declan, I thought, like, maybe I had taken the red pill, you know, from... Uh, from the Matrix, because I, I did not recognize, uh, I suppose, the, the people in the room, and there was a real sense of doing something powerful, you know, like this was some sort of kind of Catholic underground movement. It was very, very exciting. And I know it's really because we've got Immaculata Productions involved here. I know Mary, you were at the meeting last night, Mary Henning, so there was a real sense of something's going to happen here. So, like I say, I haven't been involved in the planning, but there's a, a young man here tonight, uh, Stephen Brown. Stephen, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Okay, and uh, bravo, guys, for putting this together. So, little Bula bus led the hall for Stephen Brown. Come on up here. So, just um, just a warm welcome to everyone um, in person and online uh, to tonight's Legion of Mary Men's Conference here in Dublin. Um, just before we begin, I'd like to read a small extract from a poem which I think encapsulates some of the sentiments behind tonight's event. And it reads, Lord, thou art hard on mothers. We suffer in their coming and going. And though I grudge them not, I weary, weary of the long sorrow. And yet I have my joy. My sons were faithful and they fought. This verse uh, comes from Parag Pierce's poem, The Mother. And it was written as a means of representing the grief-stricken soul of a woman who sought consolation and solace as she bid a final farewell to her children. The poem itself is a messy melting pot of religious, filial, and political identities. And because of this, it's not been universally popular in the years since. 
One prominent objection to it came from the Jesuit historian, Father Francis Shaw, who expressed his own unease with this religious allegory from Pierce. Father Shaw's objection was that there was something unseemly about Pierce appearing to equate his own political fate and his mother's accompanying angst with the divine suffering of her Lord and Our Lady. It might seem more traditional for such a notion to be expressed on behalf of families like Saints Louis and Zelie Martin or Saints Augustine and Monica, rather than in the provocative manner with which this literary mother describes her son, her soon to be departed sons. She says, the generations shall remember them and call them blessed. However, the poem was not intended as an exercise in the poet's messianic delusions or blasphemy, but rather it was composed merely to proclaim the central place of Christ's suffering in our own mor mortality. To see Christ in everything, especially in the bleakest of moments, is a perspective which comes from the deepest well of belief. This is the kind of belief that we legionaries pray for when we ask God to grant us a lively faith. The founder of the Legion, Frank Duff, lived in the same Dublin as the poet in question, Park Pierce. And Duff's work was no less revolutionary or influential than that of Pierce or of his immediate successors. Duff's writings were centered around the pivotal idea that God was always present. He moved the world and moved within it and he was no less majestic and mysterious in the spiritual lives of the unfortunate women in the Monto as those who lived in the Archbishop's palace. Duff wrote, the Holy Spirit is love, beauty, power, wisdom, purity, and all else that is of God. If he descended in plenitude, every need can be met. And the most grievous problem that can be brought into conformity with the divine will. The man who thus makes the Holy Spirit his helper enters into the tide of omnipotence. On this topic, the Legion of Mary handbook contains further eloquent musings on God's ubiquity as articulated by another Easter Rising leader, Joseph Mary Plunkett, and his poem, I See His Blood Upon the Rose. I see his blood upon the rose and in the stars the glory of his eyes. His body gleams amid eternal snows his tears fall from the skies. I see his face in every flower, his thunder and the singing of the birds are but his voice and carven by his power, rocks are his written words. All pathways by his feet are worn, his strong heart stirs the ever beaten sea. His crown of thorns is twined with every thorn, his cross is every tree. Despite the brevity of his life on earth, Joseph Mary Plunkett saw the cross in everything within creation. Yet now it seems as though our world sees it in nothing, or as Fulton Sheen put it, the Western post-Christian -Christ civilization has picked up Christ without his cross. This abject abandonment into apathy doesn't have to be the default attitude of people. People are still attracted to the mystery of our Lord's suffering and it endures in people's hearts if we take our time to observe. If we take, for example, something as common as Michelangelo's Pieta in St. Peter's in Rome, it is visited each year still by millions of eager visitors, and still they are left with a lasting impression, not just of aesthetics, of vivid and lifelike figures cut from marble, and the imprints of muscle, and the uncanny authenticity of these representations of human flesh. What is most precious to this is that each person leaves St. Peter's in Rome with something more valuable, which is a mirror of their own suffering, a mirror of their own mortality. Michelangelo's stark image of the Lady of Sorrows seems to contrast with the legionary Catina prayer, where we ask, who is she that she comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array. But in the substance of it, there's no contradiction between these two views of Her Lady. The Legion Handbook says, she knew that she was not invited only to become a mother of joys, but a woman of sorrows as well. Whatever the cultural zeitgeist was that gave rise to the construction of the Pieta, it seems very distant from our times. For it was once the Catholic male laity who gave the world its Michelangelo's and its Mozart's, the church now struggles to arouse even the slightest curiosity within European men. 
where once generations of European men etched their legacies into the building and maintenance of cathedrals and other architectures of the church. Now they would struggle to even locate such a building on a map. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the current state of religious belief amongst males, especially among the laity? Well, at the beginning of the century, Carl Joseph Ratzinger warned that Buddhism, with its focus on the inner self, will become the religion which would attract most young Westerners in the 21st century. Although Eastern forms of meditation, such as yoga, have risen in popularity, four-fifths of the Europeans who practice it are women. Interestingly, in his book, Virgo Predicanda, Frank Duff addresses another belief system which has become most synonymous with the idea of a masculine religious faith, and that is Islam. And Duff noted that even in the mid 20th century, Islam was asserting itself in such a way that it was growing at twice the rate of Catholicism. Duff mentions that the tendency of Islam had been to convert, and this was something that had been left unreciprocated in the modern world by the Catholic faith. Interestingly, Duff also notes that the position of our Blessed Lady in Islam is considerable and extraordinary. And he says that in their religion, all insist that Mary was preserved from every stain. Most importantly, he states that Islam attributes to Mary unshakable faith and absolute obedience, being thus made ready for the pouring into her of the Holy Spirit. These are comments in praise of Our Lady, which many modern Catholics could scarcely make. So the rationale behind tonight's event is very simple. Just to remind people of the importance of the involvement of lay men within the Catholic Church. Not all of us are Michelangelo, or Frank Duff, or Matt Talbot, but a laity engaged in the business of being active apostles can only be of benefit, uh, of, of benefit to all of us. The heroic legacy of the Legion demonstrates this, specifically in its fatal reckoning with the severity of communist regimes in China and elsewhere. On this topic, Frank Duff once wrote, the Legion is insistent on strength in every form. The Legion without courage would be a ridiculous opposite of what it's meant to be. So courage must be shown in every department of its activity. It will be chiefly moral courage, but not that alone. China in a big way showed that torture and death were included in our charter. Since then, those dreaded things have become common in the Legion. It is plain that our warfare must have no limits and that the Legion is not for weaklings. All the time the announcement comes of a violent death in Legion duty, that courage must be found in everything that the Legion touches. In another piece, when discussing the importance of valor in the hearts of Legionaries, Duff chose to illustrate the example of Donald Brady, an Irish soldier who died in a military air crash in the 1960s. Donald had brought his whole family into the Legion and lost his life trying to help his fellow soldiers during this fatal accident at Shannon, a bravery that Duff says is a superb quality that should be forthcoming in every legionary. Men like Donald Brady were not always readily recruitable. The first members of the Legion of Mary were overwhelmingly female, with Frank Duff having to devise more varied and creative approaches to enlistment to get reluctant men involved. Nonetheless, he spoke very highly of those men who did join, and he wrote, the appeal of the Legion to men has been dynamic, one of its chief features. Nor has that appeal been confined to the more devotional type of man whom the cruder of his sex would call sissies. The contrary applied, and drastically so. The first men's branch, which had worked experimentally for two years, has set itself to the most difficult and actually dangerous work of the now world-famous Morning Star Hostel for, for men. No more virile body of men could be found. The first men who responded to Mary's the call to Mary's army in the US were minors. They did so unhesitatingly and they were not pious. And so it's interesting that Frank Duff always had the idea that if you wanted to get men involved with the church, you had to think outside the box a little bit. And sometimes you had to get men who were active and find ways for them to be active within the church rather than passive. For Frank Duff, the, the virility of the monks on Skellig Michael, the, adventure, the adventurousness of St. Columbanus, and the pragmatic edge of the miners who formed the first American Presidium, these are the features of a capacity for genuine inclusiveness towards men that the church has largely lost sight of. 
Recent surveys have shown that men are the least likely to attend Mass. They're the least likely to say that faith is important to them. And even with the upcoming Synod, there appears to be little appetite to change this. Much of the public rhetoric is dismissive of the contribution of men within the church, and even the role of laymen within the church looks increasingly hopeless. Yet Frank Duff was fond of stating that there was no such thing as a hopeless case. With this in mind, it's worth drawing attention to the many positive signs that were not apparent even 10 years ago within the church. There have been the recent successes of men's rosary rallies in the north of Ireland and elsewhere. Many legionaries have become engaged in vibrant men's books clubs um, in Dublin and around the country. And tonight's event is just one of many that ponders the specific questions surrounding where do laymen fit into the church's current predicament, if at all. We hope that tonight's discussion and the prayers and the fact that we're all here together um, can stir something in the hearts of those of us here and those who will be watching online. As the year of St. Joseph draws to a close, we pray that we imitate the example of he who Frank Duff named as a patron saint of the Legion of Mary. As he considered St. Joseph's mystical readiness to embrace his role in the church, Pope Benedict wrote, only a man who is inwardly watchful for the divine, only someone with a real sensitivity for God and for his ways could receive God's message in this way. Under the banner of Our Lady and our patron Saint St. Joseph, we hope that they say of us what the mother says in Pierce's aforementioned poem, I have my joy, my sons were faithful, and they fought. Thank you. Brother Stephen, well, I think we, we definitely, as men, we're moved here, we're challenged here, okay? Um, and I think, again, it's great, uh, your focus there on Frank Duff, really, you know, especially in this, the centenary of the Legion, you know, to focus on his writings, to, especially as Irish men, my gosh, and you talk about Pork Pierce and Joseph Mary Plunkett, the examples, you know, just within a hundred years, we can, we can look back at these men, okay, who really, who gave it all, okay? But you're right, there is a crisis, and this is, these are the things we need to look at. There are some hard questions. There's some hard talking that we need to do as men. And are we just, you know, giving it all over to the women? Are we letting them do the heavy lifting? Um, you know, because you, you mentioned the poets there, and the great poets, but I was thinking of A.E. Houseman, uh, who wrote during the war years. But he, he had a, a lovely line saying, how men, whether we've been soldiers or not, we yearn to be soldiers. We yearn to do some soldiering. I think it's deep, especially, you know, Anto was with us today uh, in, the, in the boys' school, and you can see it. There's a natural sense, boys, men, we look for this sense of order, we look for this challenge, but you're, there has to be some heavy lifting done uh, if we're going to be serious about, um, you know, evangelizing and conversion and getting, getting everybody back into the church. But listen, I'm going to hand it over now. We've got a, a legend of the Dominicans, brother uh, Bruno Mary Kelleher. Great to have you with us. An amazing spiritual director as well. Uh, and I know, brother Bruno, you're here to talk uh, about St. Joseph, really, to pick, kind of to pick up the thread that uh, brother Stephen has uh, given us tonight. So can we have a, a warm Bula bus welcome and Falsha, brother Bruno Mary. Thank you, Emmanuel. The home of Nazareth is the school where we begin to understand the life of Jesus, the school of the gospel. How gladly would I become a child again and go to school once more in this humble and sublime school of Nazareth, close to Mary. I would wish I could make a fresh start at learning the true science of life and the higher wisdom of divine truths. These beautiful words are the words of Pope St. Paul VI speaking in the church in Nazareth. And what Christian would not share the aspiration of this saintly Pope? Therefore, I suggest what we do tonight is enter that home of the Holy Family in Nazareth and see what we can discover there of the true science of life as a sure guide for our lives as Christian men. I wish in particular to look more closely at the man of the house, Saint Joseph, 
as this year dedicated to him draws to a close. For as Frank Duff wrote, St. Joseph, in a special way, stands for the male sex. Now, tradition has always spoken of Jesus as the new Adam and Mary as the new Eve. But of course, God began his original creation with a married couple, the foundation of family. And therefore, it was only proper that his new creation begin with the same foundation, renewed and perfected. But for this, God needed St. Joseph to be the husband of the new Eve, so that, as John Paul says, at the culmination of the history of salvation, when God reveals his love for humanity through the gift of the word, it is precisely the marriage of Mary and Joseph that brings to realization in full freedom the spousal gift of self in receiving and expressing such a love. Frank Duff notes in his essay on St. Joseph that after Eve had yielded to the suggestions of the fallen angel, Adam surrendered to Eve and thus he ratified and consummated her sin. Then in contrast, we have Mary who assents to the words of the angel Gabriel, which then needs an act by a man to consummate and ratify it. And in this instance, it's Joseph's act of faith to his own annunciation, where we find this concurrence of the male partner, which makes suitable this divine act of restoring and undoing Adam's fault. So therefore, we have at the beginning of creation, the first couple, the pinnacle of God's creation, the clearest reflection of his triune nature, which had prompted Adam to announce in discovery of this only partner worthy of his companionship, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. But then the taint of sin corrupted the perfect relationship between the man and the woman and corrupted this image of God. And down through the millennia, we have found the discord and conflict between the sexes and into our own lives. In trying to understand how to overcome this division and conflict through God's grace and to restore again a proper male-female relationship in our society, there can be no better example than that of the marriage with which God began his new creation. If we look at St. Joseph's spousal love for Mary, perhaps we shall see how we should relate to the women in our lives, and especially for those of us in the Legion, how we as men should relate to the Virgin Mary. How should a man love a woman? It sounds like some sort of tacky song lyrics, but really it's a serious centuries-old question. In St. Joseph, we find the characteristics of a masculine love that has been purified and strengthened by grace. So that as John Paul II says, Joseph was bound to Mary by a husband's love. And are we not to suppose that his love as a man was also given new birth by the Holy Spirit? If we are to learn to live and love as men, we must do as Pope Paul VI suggests and return to the school of Nazareth. So then, in entering the house of St. Joseph in Nazareth, we actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus and Mary. For as scripture tells us, Jesus was conceived while Mary was betrothed to a man named Joseph, but before they came to be together. Now this is not to say, as you sometimes hear said nowadays, that Mary was like a single mom. Betrothal in Israel at that time was a much more serious and substantial union than what we think of when we think of an engagement. Uh, John Paul explains it well. He says, according to Jewish custom, marriage took place in two stages. First, the legal or true marriage was celebrated. And then only after a certain period of time, the husband brought the wife into his own house. Now, from this latter act, 
this bringing of Mary with the infant Jesus in her womb into his house, I wish to suggest to you an image, the image of a lighthouse, because I want to use that as a metaphor for the example that St. Joseph gives us. Picture for a moment the lighthouses that are scattered throughout the waters of Ireland, perched on precipitous cliffs or on isolated islands or on cragged rocks surrounded by treacherous seas. And I think you will quickly see there an image for the earnest Catholic man striving to live his faith in modern secular Ireland. Then again, is there not something inspiring in seeing the waves crash over Fastnet Lighthouse in a storm, as if the next wave would wash it all away? And yet, there it stands, defiant, daring the storm to do its worst. Now, If someone was to build a lighthouse on as forsaken a space as Fastnet Rock just for the sake of defiance, it would be foolishness at least, if not overweening pride. But the lighthouse is there enduring its trials for the sake of others. But then, as the name indicates, it is the light which it casts that is of service to others. The light is Christ, and Mary is like the lighthouse keeper who brings the light into our lives and keeps it burning. The lighthouse existence is meaningless without the light and its keeper. Like St. Joseph then, we bring them into our home, and in doing so we achieve not only our own purpose in life, but we also become a beneficial signal lamp for others. It's also worth noting that while a lighthouse may be of use to ships for navigational purposes at all times, it really comes into its own in times of storm and tempest, when it's not only guiding ships to their destinations, but safeguarding them from the destruction on the rocks. The lighthouse must endure the storm because it is then that it is most needed. Well, I tell you, a storm has rolled over Ireland in recent decades, causing widespread destruction. But that is all the more reason for us men to stand tall and visible, shining the light of Christ far and wide to warn of the dangers to Christian souls. Now, this calls for a spirit of self-sacrifice and courage of just the sort we see in the actions of Saint Joseph. Here he was a simple, humble, ordinary man, confronted by the unexpected, Mary's pregnancy. This is deeply unsettling and troubling news for him. It is not something that he easily comprehends. So how does he respond? Well, we are told in scriptures that Joseph is diakolos, It's a Greek word, usually translated in our Bibles as just or upright. But in Israel, it meant especially something more. It meant one who was obedient to the commands of God. So naturally, therefore, Joseph turns to God's law, the Jewish Torah, as he seeks a way out of his predicament. Yet contrast St. Joseph's approach to the law with that of the Pharisees, or even many of our own contemporaries, Modern man often comes to the law with a sort of an overemphasis on asserting one's rights under the law. The law becomes what I use to demand things, even sometimes something of an instrument of vengeance. The law becomes weaponized. It's a tool by which I get my share and my due, regardless of the consequences to others. Well, if St. Joseph had exerted his rights under the law, as outlined in Deuteronomy 22, he would have known that Mary would have been in danger of a public stoning. Instead, St. Joseph finds a response in the law, which is divorcing her quietly, that coheres with charity, allowing him to spare Mary from public shame and possibly worse. 
Thus, in the example of Joseph, we discover that law is not a soulless list of rules and regulations. It's not something demanding concessions of your freedom and in return granting certain amount of rights. Rather, God's law, as found in scripture and the norms of the church, is a guide, a guide by which the Christian man can discover how to live the precept of charity, how to truly love our neighbor. Joseph sought to discover God's will for him in his trial, which is why when the angel appeared to him to tell him, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary for your, life, for your wife, he is ready to respond with alacrity. More than that, he really trusts in the words of the angel to not be afraid, and he acts courageously. It is obvious from scriptures that Mary's pregnancy has become known. And you can imagine in a rural town that this would have generated no small amount of gossip and possibly even calumny directed at St. Joseph when he doesn't divorce her. It took St. Joseph as much courage to act in this moment in the face of his local community, in the face of those he knew best, in the face of being shamed and having his reputation unjustly sullied, as it did for him to act to save the child and his mother from the murderous Herod. I really think there's a lesson for us all here, which is that it can take greater courage to walk in God's ways when those opposing us aren't strangers, aren't murderous kings, but our closest friends and relatives. And when what is hurled at us is not spears and arrows, but barbed comments and disdainful looks, and when what is in danger of being taken away from us is not our biological life, but our comfortable lives in the community, our sort of easy membership in society. St. Joseph was able to act in the face of all that because, as Pope Francis noted in his apostolic letter announcing this year of St. Joseph, Joseph set aside his own ideas in order to accept the course of events and, mysterious as they seemed to be, to embrace them take responsibility for them, and make them part of his own history. From this example, His Holiness counsels all of us to set aside all anger and disappointment and to embrace the way things are, even when they do not turn out as we wish. Yet not with mere resignation, but with hope and courage. When we do so, we will discover, like Saint Joseph, that God will show us the meaning in the most incomprehensible events and will draw good from what seemed like hopeless and lost causes to us. So St. Joseph's married life had a less than what we might call auspicious beginning. Any marital plans that he had have certainly been thrown out the window. He doesn't know how everything will pan out. His economic security is definitely disrupted by having to flee to Egypt. His family lives under a very ominous shadow amid political and social instability. But he commits himself wholeheartedly to his vocation. He turns his human vocation to domestic love into a superhuman oblation of self. How many men in Ireland find themselves in a similar boat when facing the prospect of marriage? In an age that likes to think life can be planned out to proceed in orderly stages, marriage can seem daunting, and it's often overburdened with idealistic misconceptions and expectations. And as a result, it becomes something that not to be tackled until you have sufficient money, until unrealistic assurances have been obtained, so you keep putting it off. And in the stopgap, we have selfish substitutes that take the place of genuine marriage. And then as a result then, society engages in a wholesale farce of what we may, might call trial marriages. St. Joseph didn't look for any of that in preparation for his marriage. His resources for marriage are the riches of scripture and the daily work of his own hands. 
His assurances are his faith in God and his faith in Mary. God responds to Joseph's generosity in marriage, his willingness to sacrifice himself, and his magnanimity. God responds by providing all that was necessary to adequately fulfill the role that he has taken in history. After all, later on, the crowds will have no difficulty in identifying Jesus as the carpenter's son. And that speaks volumes about St. Joseph and the kind of man he was. Yes, the vocation to marriage is exceedingly challenging today, more so maybe than at any time in Irish history. It's full of unknowns and potential pitfalls. But a response after the manner of St. Joseph will see a comparable gift of the necessary graces in order to live that vocation. All it takes is nerve and daring to set out into the deep with a willingness to die to self, which after all accords with God's original vision for marriage, since after marriage there is no longer two but one. The individual dies in marriage and lives a new life as one half of a whole as one sharing in a whole with another. This is not a loss, but a gain, as we see in St. Joseph's marriage to Mary. Pope Leo XIII explains it in some truly beautiful words in which he discusses the nature of marriage. He says, It is certain that the dignity of the mother of God is so exalted that nothing could be more sublime. Yet because Mary was united to Joseph by the bond of marriage, there could be no doubt but that Joseph approached as no other person ever could that eminent dignity whereby the mother of God towers above all creatures. Since marriage is the highest degree of association and friendship involving by its very nature a communion of goods, it follows that God, by giving Joseph to the Virgin, did not give him to her only as a companion for life, a witness of her virginity and protector of her honor, he also gave Joseph to Mary in order that he might share, through the marriage pact, in her own sublime greatness. You know that in the canon of the Mass, the prayer for the, uh, during the Eucharist, St. Joseph's name follows immediately after Mary's, before all the apostles, all the popes, all the martyrs. He is accorded after her the highest honors of the church. Yet these are given to him because above all else, he is Mary's spouse. In marriage, St. Joseph became not only most fully himself, the man he could be, but he also shares in what is properly Mary's. To enter into marriage, St. Joseph had to be willing to shoulder responsibility, to forgo personal plans, to renounce that natural conjugal love that is the foundation and nourishment of the family, to accept rather than to, to demand, to live for others rather than for himself, to labor assiduously, to relinquish certain rights even. But because of all this, because of this utter self-disregard, he received through Mary the highest favors from God. I think this last point also indicates the role of Mary in all our lives. Frank Duff writes that Joseph's association to the Incarnation was immeasurably higher in degree and different in kind from the cooperation of any of the saints. Saint Joseph's proximity to Christ comes about because of his bond to Mary. So that as Louis Boyer says, Mary is the only one through whom men reach Jesus and the only one through whom Jesus reaches men. This will be no less true for all of us than it was for St. Joseph. Now, it's not that it's all one-way traffic. Mary needed Joseph too. I ask you to think of those scriptural accounts where the Holy Family visits the temple in Jerusalem. Now, there were places in the temple that were off limits to women. Mary cannot go there. And so it's up to Joseph to do what is needed, to bring Jesus into the sanctuary. Likewise, when Jesus was being circumcised, as his legal father, it's Joseph who confers on him the name Jesus, 
which means God saves. And it's Joseph who is the first one to speak the name. And in speaking it, he also proclaims the child's mission as savior, which funnily enough makes Joseph, the famously silent man of scripture, the first one to announce God's mission to save. Mary also needs men today, especially legionnaires, to bring Jesus to places which in a certain way she can't go. And she needs us also to assume the responsibility of pronouncing the name of Jesus unashamedly and boldly. Joseph is also the provider for Mary and Jesus. And for this, we accord him the title of patron of workers, especially those who labor to provide for their families by the sweat of their brow. Now we live in a world that's dominated by workaholism and careerism. And in the midst of all that, St. Joseph teaches us the true value of work, which is that it is a means of participating in the work of salvation, an opportunity to hasten the coming of the kingdom, to develop our talents and abilities, and to put them at the service of society and fraternal communion. I think men especially are often under pressure to define themselves by their work, as if having certain professions or positions are necessary achievements, or that what is important in life is the dream job that provides all the meaning for one's life, and that if one fails to attain such a job, then one's working life is merely drudgery and unimportant. Well, St. Joseph united his humble work to God's redemptive plan, and in that way made it meaningful, showing us that what is important is the sanctification of daily life, a sanctification which each person must acquire according to his or her own state in life. If one's state in life is as a husband and father, then the primary value of a man's labor stems from its contribution to family life. And from this perspective, the man who toils in a workshop is no different to the man who's in the boardroom. However, it also means that if we allow our work to become all-consuming, or even just the dominant feature of our lives as men, to the detriment of our family life, then the value of the work we do, no matter how much society may laud and value it, is actually being diminished. We must not allow the world of work to come before our families. Or, that's if we have them, but if we don't, we must not allow work to become before our prospective families. Modernity extols the hard worker. Think of the guest speakers at graduation ceremonies. They're always alumni who went on to become successful entrepreneurs, millionaires. They rarely invite back, if ever, the man who made his life about raising a large family. But I tell you, the vocation to fatherhood is greater than any possible career. And so, as much as we plan and prepare boys and young men for a future working life, so much the more should we prepare them for married life and for a future as husbands and fathers. Like the lighthouse in the tempest, we need fathers now more than ever to shine the light of Christ, to defend the domestic church, the family, and to give their lives as a gift to their wives and children. John Paul tells us that St. Joseph's fatherhood, a relationship that places him as close as possible to Christ, to whom every election and predestination is ordered, comes to pass through marriage to Mary, that is, through the family. Fatherhood is no mere biological reality. It's only fully understood in the context of marriage, through the perpetual bond with the mother. Men in Ireland must stand up to defend their right to fatherhood, true fatherhood, which requires a defense of marriage and family. All the pseudo-marriages and counterfeit families of modernity must be opposed by all men, 
because they rob all men of fatherhood, which belongs to us all. Now, you might think this is somewhat nonsensical. You might say to yourself, well, if my own marriage is true and genuine, how can my fatherhood be stolen from me? How can I be affected by someone else's private life? Well, alas, I tell you, all lies, and that's what these pseudo-relationships are, they're not real. All lies undermine reality and undermine reality for us all. And then these false families diminish the nature of fatherhood in our society, make it less than it really is, which is a crime against all men who live in that society. Saint Joseph took firm and decisive action to protect the Holy Family, and we must imitate him as guardians by sure and concrete action. Joseph really is he's a man of action, Scripture tells us repeatedly that when God communicates with him in dreams, upon waking up, he immediately does as the Lord commanded. However, for all that he is a man of action, he is in scriptures enveloped in an aura of silence, which is to say that he had a contemplative core. At the heart of him is prayer. And that's what makes all his action possible. St. John Paul II tells us, the total sacrifice whereby Joseph surrendered his whole existence to the demands of the Messiah's coming into his home becomes understandable only in the light of his profound interior life. If we are to imitate Joseph in his decisive action, in his role as defender of the family, we too must first learn to live in daily contact with Jesus to dwell with Jesus and Mary. We must be just and upright men, living embodiments of the scripture like he. Like Joseph, we must observe the ritual requirements of our, relig of our religion. In his case, it was the Jewish ritual. In our case, that means a rich sacramental life. Finally, in the midst of an ever more noisy world, we must create a place for silence so that we too can hear the angel of God speaking to us. I'll conclude with the most striking line um, that I found from Pope Francis' apostolic letter. He said in that, he said that Joseph did not look for shortcuts, but confronted reality with open eyes and accepted personal responsibility for it. Well, modernity is actively engaged in a project of denying reality, of denying truth. And as part of this project, it does not want men to be men. Instead of reality, it presents falsehoods, false relationships, fake fatherhoods, perverted models of manhood, and meaningless distraction instead of purposeful activity. It wants men to surrender their responsibilities to the mammy state. It encourages them to treat women and children as objects rather than as persons that they are called to provide for and to protect. Instead of the demands and challenges of reality that would require grit and character, it presents us with social media and the cyber world so that fleeing from the difficulty of dealing with real relationships, real conflicts, real questions, men spend their time living in an alternate reality, which is to say, no reality. I hope that in contrast to the fiction presented by the secular world, this talk has shown the characteristics of real men, as modeled by Saint Joseph, who showed courage, dedication, self-sacrifice, obedience, humility, respect and submission to God's law as the supreme guide to charity. And yet for all that was an ordinary, humble worker who was a silent contemplative and yet also a man of action, a husband and a father 
who shared all that he had and all that he was. Saint Joseph, defender of the church, pray for us. Um, Brother Bruno, that was a, a stunning uh, presentation. Uh, I feel like we're witnessing something here at the Halden Collider These uh, between Steve and Brother Bruno. Um, I don't know about you men, but I feel I've been slowly atomized here and weaponized. And uh, we may have come in here a little bit weary from our work, you know, a tough week or whatever. But uh, we're, we're walking out of this room, we're marching out onto those streets, we're coming out like crusaders. This is so many... Uh, so many uh, inspirational notes here being sounded, and so many true things being said, so many authentic things, challenging things, things that we have to hear. But listen, Brother Bruno Mary, if I could uh, get you back up here onto the mic and to lead us now in the Katina. So if we could all stand, please, let's go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, Terrible is an army set in battle array. My soul glorifies the Lord. He looks on his servant in her lowliness. Henceforth, all ages will call me blessed. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He casts the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He protects Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array? O Mary, conceived without sin. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, our mediator with the Father, you have been pleased to appoint the most blessed Virgin, your mother, to be our mother also, and our mediatrix with you. Mercifully grant that whoever comes to you seeking your favors may rejoice to receive all of them through her. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. At this section of the evening, we're going to just invite uh, Leandro Diaz, and he's going to read um, a, a very beautiful poem for us by Hilaire Belloc. So, can we just give a, a warm bullet bus for Leandro, uh, an active and very impressive legionary? Thanks, Brother Manuel. Thanks to everyone who is here and you watching us online at your home. Uh, I'm here today to recite a poem to you, and this poem is from Hilaire Belloc. It's, the, it's a poem about the greatest love story ever told, a, a poem about the love of a mother and her son. The name of the poem is Our Lord and Our Lady. They warned our Lady, for the child that was our blessed Lord. And she took him into the desert wild over the Camus Ford. And a long song she sang to him and a short story told. And she wrapped him in a woolen cloak to keep him from the cold. But when our Lord was a grown man, the rich they dragged him down and they crucified him in Gogota, out and beyond the town. They crucified him on Calvary upon an April day. And because he had been her little son, she followed him all the way. Our Lady stood beside the cross, a little space apart. And when she heard our Lord cry out, a sword went through her heart. They laid our Lord in a marble tomb, dead in a winding sheet. But Our Lady stands above the world with the white moon 
at her feet. It's beautiful, isn't it? Brother Leandro, truly a stunning, beautiful poem, but I must say, beautifully recited by yourself. So again, Bula Bus, Brother Leandro. Fabulous. And you know, it's funny, uh, Brother Leandro, I was talking to Sean Grace. He's in the in Vino in Veritas book club, uh, led by the, the wonderful uh, Father Colin Mannion. But uh, we were just talking actually about poetry, you know, it came up in our little uh, chit chat. But it seems to me that poetry, you know, it's, it's been greatly overlooked in recent years. There seems to be a whole kind of a attack on language. You know, we seem to be thrown out, coming up with all these new crazy pronouns. But there's such a richness in poetry. And uh, I was struck by, I think it's the Italians describe poets as acrobats of the soul. You know, and I think there's a richness here and there's so many, you know, we're, t you know, we're looking at the example of St. Joseph. There's so many things we can look at as Catholic men, in, especially in Catholic literature. And I definitely think poetry has been overlooked. So I'm delighted to see that it's been, it's been given such reverence here tonight in, the, in this conference's content. And definitely, like I say, there's a lot of inspiration coming out of this. So on that note, we're going to hand it back over to uh, Brother Bruno Mary, and he's going to lead us now in a panel discussion. And uh, the panel guests tonight, if I could just introduce them. So again, we have uh, Stephen Brown, Brother Stephen Brown. So if you want to come up on stage, Stephen. And also we've got uh, Tom Smith. So Brother Tom, if you'd also like to come up, okay. Come on up, men. And uh, if you want to join us here, please. So um, while we've heard many great things, I, I, I think one of the prompts for this uh, series of, of conferences for men is that many of the things I think that we took for granted in Ireland in previous generations aren't there anymore, the things that supported Catholic men that we didn't really pay much attention to, but were the reasons why people, why men in Ireland practiced the faith. Such that I think if I'd asked my grandfather, why are you Catholic? He wouldn't have even understood the question. It wouldn't have made any sense in a previous Ireland. But it is an important question today. Um, and it is a valid question. Why are you Catholic when so many others aren't? Uh, or maybe why be Catholic uh, in Ireland today? Um, so perhaps we could throw that out there to the three of yourselves and just ask, like, was there, was there a point in your life where you decided, I'm going to be Catholic. As a man in Ireland today, I'm going to be Catholic. And the reason why maybe you... You, you did that. I think it'd be worth, worth hearing. Well, I suppose, I suppose to start, um, I'd probably say that although I can see how, how good kind of the faith is on its own merits, definitely kind of when I was in college, I would have said like, that I started to see how important the faith was in contrast to everything else, you know? So, I know when I was in college myself, a lot of the um, a lot of the kind of popular stuff at the time. If you went to a bookshop, like Richard Dawkins would have been mm. a number one bestseller, and uh, you would have had a lot of Hitchens and other people mm. like that talking about atheism, and um, the world just seemed in a very strange spot. And you would have had the economic crash and all these other things, and so. Um, I think there were just a lot of those things. And then in the midst of it, I guess, what I found with a lot of those things was they were, they were so, um, they seemed so shallow when you really got to the bottom of it. And I guess when I looked into them a lot deeper, um, you know, I came across people like Nietzsche, I came across people like that and looked into them deeper and I didn't find anything substantial in there, you know? And certainly there was no example, if you're talking about examples of people's life like St. Joseph, I mean, Chesterton wrote about Nietzsche that, Nietzsche had a real uh, jealousy towards Joan of Arc because Joan of Arc was everything Nietzsche mm. thought he was because Joan of Arc was a, she was actually a warrior. She mm. was actually a saint. Mm. She was actually someone who was a real hero, you know? And Nietzsche wanted to be these things, but he was actually kind of a pathetic figure at the back of it. But anyway, so I suppose my own sake, I'd always, it's like if you ask someone today, why would you be a Catholic? And people would say, oh, well, I am a Catholic. Mm. But it might have mm. a different definition, you know? And I suppose at that time, just by chance, I got reading Aquinas and Augustine, and I realized these were the stories that they were without parallel. And there was something about them that was, if you look at their lives, especially St. Augustine's life, you know, how, and, and then how he turned his, his own kind of problems into not just being a saint, but the writings he left behind, and everything about it was beautiful, you know? 
And same with Aquinas. If you look at the world, I suppose the time I was in college, I just think the world was, a lot of the things we taught were, had a solid foundation to it, like the Celtic Tiger or something. Mm. They just, they didn't at the back of it, you know? And then you read something like Aquinas and you think to yourself, wow, seven, 800 years of this, and it's, it's still powerful. And then all the other implications to it towards the, the Eucharist and the Mass, and then towards even being a human being, you know, it has a heavy thing to it. So I suppose in short, I would say that, you know, as Chesterton said, there's a million reasons why I'm Catholic, but the bottom one is that it's, it's true, you yes. know? And yes. I think that if people go digging long enough, um, I think that's just what they'll find. And they'll find it especially in the lives of people like Frank Duff and St. Joseph. And there's so many people out there, even in this room tonight, people who are involved with the Legion and the people, people can't see it on the camera, but we're facing a wall that has the Legion envies around mm. the world, you know? And they would have gone to all these parts of the world and some of them would have died trying to help other people and some of them would have given their lives to it. And yeah, I think we can't, we can't underestimate the, the power of sainthood and proving that it's, it's true, you know? I so. think I hear you saying someone, someone you, I think it was yourself, Emmanuel, brought up earlier the, the, the movie, uh, The Matrix, and oh, something yeah. similar to that. Yeah. You've, you've, Christianity is the pill and you've, you've woken up and you've realized everything else is just, it's, there's no substance to it. There's, it's not really real. Yeah. And when you see, when you've explored the faith, you encounter the faith in the writings, in the saints, in lived examples. There's something there, there's something yeah. real. Yeah. Well, that's something it. True. And you say to yourself, um, like I know myself a few years ago, I went to, I was in Lourdes, you know, and I volunteered there a few times. Mm. But I remember once I was just sitting there and uh, you're kind of very busy the whole week with the kids and stuff. You don't get time to think, you know. But I remember there was one day I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, and I, I remember I had an hour off. I was just sitting having a coffee and I was looking around. It was a real sunny day. And there was all the people pushing, people who were disabled in the, in the wheelchairs, and there was people, you know, in the beds and, and the whole lot. And I was looking at the scene and I was thinking, you know, if, if the Catholic faith was, was wrong, I was kind of thinking, a scene like this wouldn't exist. Right. As in a scene like this where the, these people were being cared for in this way. Mm. And I ha the thing about it was when I was looking out, everyone had a big smile on their face. I just, it was so... Um, it was kind of shocking, really, you know? And you think to yourself, there's so many examples like that. So I know people can point to the examples of people who go the other way, and so on and so forth. But again, to quote, um, what if, not Chester, it was Fulton Sheen who said, you should judge, you know, the faith by the people who live it most, mm. you know? And I suppose those type of things are like that. So I suppose, in short, you see the solid ground that it's on, that all these great people wrote, and then all the great applications it has for life, you know? And when it's applied properly, it's a very, it's a very kind of revolutionary thing, you know? And I saw someone say on Twitter earlier, it was a priest, a priest was talking about Dorothy Day, and he was saying, you know, the thing about Dorothy Day is she, was, she wasn't liberal or conservative. She was just radical. It was just something totally different. And it'll always be something radical and different, you know? And so I suppose in short, that's the fact that it always stands out that's different. That's kind of, that's why I think that it's, um, it's the last thing a person would think of, yeah. you know? Or yourself, Emmanuel, do you? About uh, being Catholic? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, why? Like, why, 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 why go through, the, like, it is a struggle to be a Catholic man in Ireland today, and no one's expecting you to do it, and no one's demanding of it, you really, so yeah. why do it? Uh, I suppose for myself, uh, Brother Bruno Mary, um, I suppose, you know, I grew up, say, 70s, 80s Ireland, and uh, just thinking about the discussion here tonight, I realised I grew up in, a, in a, a kind of a blessed time because there were still men and women going to Mass. And I think about the parish that I'm from, uh, Parish of Our Lady Help for Christians there in the Navan Road. So it's kind of, a, for me, it's a very special place because it's kind of where East meets West, you know, where you got uh, lots of families, say, from Cabra, and you got all these kind of, you know, called them what they are, Culchies, who moved in mm. in the 50s and 60s. But something special happened because a real community grew up. And when you talk to parishioners of a certain age, they always talk about the wonderful priests that we had. And these, these were the guys who were leading, you know. And as an altar boy, and I have to say, I was an altar boy 
you know, in a time when there were squadrons of altar mm. boys. I mean, they were, they were just running amok. There was, they had to have altar boy football leagues just to kind of keep us, you know, keep, keep us busy. But it was great. And you wanted to be an altar boy. You wanted to be in the GAA. You wanted to be on the soccer team. But you did it. And you waited for the weekly roster. You know, I remember it was Father Kelly. We thought, well, he's typing it up. This is serious, you know. And then... Uh, you were, I suppose, sometimes, some of us, we may have dreaded getting the half seven mass. That was like, that was the tough gig. But you know, but you were proud and you loved being it. And there was this sense that this is what, this is what boys and men do. And we go to mass and the, I remember the, like the older parishioners, like they'd, they'd clip you around the ear. Listen, if you weren't uh, stepping up, if you weren't taking it seriously. And um, that was there. And it's funny, just so, I was, you know, I was trying to compose my thoughts there and I said, I suppose, for me, when, when did that begin to drift? And I would say, when I got to the end of primary school, I felt very kind of secure in my faith. And I remember, you know, I remember you know, even doing, say, Stations of the Cross, knowing that was important. And, and I really believe it was because the priests were so involved in the school. You know, I remember we had one priest, who was a parish priest, Monsignor Mar. Oh, I mean, you could, you could have put this guy on YouTube. He was just a big personality. And I'd say, I see Colin Hayden is here tonight. He's one of those guys, if he came into your classroom, it was going to be a riot because the, the kids just loved him, right? But that's, and I just want to share this example of this man, right? Because he was a parish priest. He was active. He was involved in the schools. He was involved in the parish. But I saw him retire, but he didn't even retire. He went and he, he volunteered in the local secondary school to teach religious education. Now that's, even Father Harris, another legendary Dominican, that's a, that's a very tough gig. But he volunteered. I also remember him, he would walk around different areas of the parish with his bravery, and there'd be you know, gangs of us, you know, as teenagers hanging out. And he'd challenge us in the most gentle and courageous way. And I kind of thought, well, there was a guy who gave everything to the parish. So I had that example, but for me, when I, I felt I began to drift from the faiths, Brother Bruno, would have been in secondary school. And I loved my secondary school and I had fabulous teachers, but something happened around the teaching of religious education. And I kind of felt it wasn't taken seriously. And I kind of felt, looking at it now as an educator, it seemed to be the job that no other teacher wanted. You know, so it kind of, or maybe the teacher possibly who was underperforming or hadn't been properly challenged. And, and I'm sure there's a story there, but I just kind of felt, well, you know, it just seemed a shame because it was a Catholic school, but it was like the teaching of education. And I feel we see it now in the primary school transitioning into, into from primary into secondary school. It's such a big phase and becoming a teenager. There's so many questions suddenly leaping up. And I think this is where I think there has to be a serious, you know, conversation about Catholic education. But anyway, for me, I drifted and I drifted. I got to be honest, and I suppose the, the world flooded in. But at some point, thankfully, um, I, I realized that I, I loved teaching. And I remember I was working for a tech company in Switzerland. I was in the boardroom. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. But uh, I had done some teaching previously. And I just said, you know, I really want to be a teacher. It was a real kind of, uh, yeah, it was definitely a matrix moment. Mm. So I, I, I had to get myself out of there. But then when I thought about teaching, because I thought, well, I'm going to go back to Ireland now. I said, because I know to be a teacher in Ireland, to be a primary school teacher, we're going to be involved in preparing children for the sacraments. And I said, I need to get my house in order. And I, I said, if I'm going to be serious about this, I need to kind of reconnect with my faith. And uh, I remember something, you know, so, something was kind of stirring in me. And I remember doing the teacher training. And I remember there was a, a presentation uh, by Father Vincent Twomey. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I'm, I'm, listen, it pains me to admit this, I'm probably not the greatest student, and I, I found teacher training it was very, very demanding. But this guy, I gotta say, now he, there was maybe, there must have been maybe three, 300 of us uh, in the same room, so obviously well before COVID. And uh, I remember, I, I, I got the sense nobody was really taking the, that seriously. I'm not saying, oh, give myself the big I am here, but they were kind of pretty much, oh, this is the religious section, we're just, you know, there was a lot of lattes and cappuccinos floating around and, you know. But this guy, he came out, you know, and uh, I don't know if you remember that TV show, The Paper Chase, there was a, there was a guy in, I think, Kingsfield or whatever, but he was a very dignified kind of uh, law speaker. But he came out, I said, this guy, this, this is going to be quality. And I remember actually placing myself up right up the front because I didn't want to miss a word. Something, there was something happening here. And I remember taking copious notes, right? I did not want to miss a word of this. 
and he spoke about the Eucharist, and he spoke about preparing ch children well for First Holy Communion. And I was really, I, I was stunned. And I remember we got the religious assignment, and again, I would say my assignments up till then probably had been, you know, it was probably definitely subpar. But I said, no, I said, Father Vincent, he's, you know, he's really, he's, he's set the fire here. I remember putting a lot of work into it. And it was the one assignment that I was actually, I kind of prayed about, I wanted to score well, and I was, I was chuffed with it. And I realized in that, that something had happened for me. And then I know I shared the story already with Brother Declan, but anyway, thank God I, I successfully completed my training and I was uh, appointed to a, an all boys Catholic school. I remember feeling, feeling good about it because, you know, my principal at the time, uh, chap, uh, Mr. Brendan Clare, lovely guy from the parish, and he gave me second class. I said, oh, this is going to be great, you know, because, you know, that's, that's what I'd written my assignment on. And I was really, really thrilled. But day one, one of the first questions I got was, Mr. Burke, do you believe in God? Right? And I felt, you know, yes, I was able to, I was able to answer, you know, straight away with full confidence because I didn't want to be in front of those boys. I did not want to be in there and kind of making a kind of a, a mockery of the faith or just pretending or saying, you know, just nodding along because I wanted that job. No, I really wanted to be there because I felt there was, a, as a teacher, it's, it's vocation and there's a special duty there. And that was, that was a special moment, you know, that, and I, I kind of realized, okay, it was important. And since then, and maybe because, of, you know, in this work, I have found I've been challenged, but it continually, it continuously mm. urges me to grow in the faith. Mm. And I suppose then, from that, the next key moment for me then would be yeah, joining the Legion. And then that that was for me that was like a, a very special moment. And it happened 2015. And I suppose up till then, I suppose I've been a bit of a, I suppose a spiritual pinball. I was kind of rocking all over the place. But the Legion gave me something very solid. And I kind of I. I don't mind saying this, but I kind of describe my life as before the Legion and after the Legion. And a lot of things just make sense now. And you're right, uh, Brother Steve, it's great to, to see the envoys there on the wall, but actually Sister Mary is herself an envoy. So, but there's, there's so much to take from this. But anyway, get, just to kind of round this off now, sorry Tom, not to take away time from you. But um, yeah, so that's how I've arrived at this, and I, I, I take it as a responsibility, and everything you talked about tonight, Brother Bruno, you know, all the things that I suppose men aren't doing, we see the fallout, I'm sure uh, Colin would agree as well, we see the fallout in children today, right. you know, and I would say in my role today, I spend most of my time trying to, you know, work with children, but when I get to the root of it, it's because I feel, because dad isn't doing that work, yeah. And maybe it isn't being encouraged to. I'm not. I'm not going to sound that too heavy. But that's 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 it for me, brother. I think I heard in your in, in what you had to say. Not only like it was interesting that those young boys posed that question to you. It shows that boy are like the bo young men out there, young men, boys, the sons and grandsons of men in this room. They want to know that question from a man. There's very few men in their lives now that they can ask. Maybe at best a father. In many boys, increasingly, there's no father on the scene at home, sadly. And so they, need a, they have no role, male role model to ask that question of. Do you believe in God? So it's so vital, I, I, I applaud you, the, the, there's so few male teachers now, and it's, it's robbing young boys of a male role model, which, as we saw in your own story, was so vital to the faith when you were in primary school, to look around and see men as role models. And I think, you know, it's, it's not for, for men tuning in and, and men here in the room. Um, it's not only for own, our own practice of the faith, but I'm sure there's men here who are concerned about how we're going to hand on the faith to our sons and to our grandsons maybe. Um, and I think there's a few things in your, in your own personal uh, account that, that point out young boys look for role models. They look for guys to look up to. Um, and so that's what we need to be. Speaking of fathers needing to hand on the faith, um, we turn to a man who welcomed his first son on All Souls Day, Michael Joseph Mary, was it? Michael Joseph Mary. Michael yeah. Joseph Mary. So, <laughs> so um, as you look, as you look to to hand on your faith to your son, you might illuminate us a little bit as to how you have that gift to give to him in, in some. Please God, yeah. So um, yeah, I might, I might yawn a bit tonight because I'm exhausting the last few days, but uh, <laughs> understandable. understandable. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, I suppose. Um, 
as Stephen said, but as Stephen said there, it's, it's the fact that it's true, I suppose. And it probably be a little different to the lads there. The lads seem a bit much more red than me, but I was just like, so I know a lad out in the beer and stuff, whatever. But I just, one day, just looked up to the cross and asked, what's, what's the story with that, I suppose? And over the years, I did keep, keep going to mass and stuff, but I was very much of the world. I was very much, you know, doing what lads do, I suppose, going out drinking and whatever else and all and I kept I, I, for some reason I read the Bible when I was in my twenties and stuff but I was kind of living this kind of double life kind of going to mass but but I didn't know anything I didn't I really was so ignorant but um, and over the years through through the through through or later the spirit whatever it was um, I I kept kind of coming back to the Catholic faith I kept trying to learn about it I kept trying to find um, I used to follow this Protestant stuff it's about um, prophecy and stuff and all but it took it took actually a girl I met one time to tell me the truth I suppose of the fact that she said to me Tom do you know that you can't receive you can't receive the Lord or can't receive the Eucharist in a state of sin I just didn't I, I just grew up a Catholic I grew up you know in the church, I remember, I remember even my mom, God bless her, and she was great for us, she always prayed for us and all, but I remember Mitch and Mass and all, and just calling like crazy stuff and all, but it, was, it wasn't until I kind of heard that truth that I couldn't receive. So what I used to do then, I used to go, go I used to start going to confession. Um, I'm laughing because I used to keep, I keep kept, kept in my ways, but in order to receive, I'd go to confession before Mass. And this went on and on, and what happened though through that, experience was the reality of what I was actually doing became much more real and um, <clears throat> I just it came to a head and it was, it was the drink for me it was one thing that was really pulling me down I think and I went to confession over in Mount Marion and the Queen of Peace Church over there and I fell again basically and a priest said to me in confession he said to me you'll basically go to hell if, if quite, quite strong but sometimes that's probably not needed. But for me, at that particular time, I was like, okay. I knew, I knew it, but I needed the words to be spoken to me by, by a man, I suppose, you know, by a priest. And from then on, I said, okay, the drink has to stop. And slowly me sure I had to pull myself away from my, my friends, in a sense. And that was hard as well. I was trying to maneuver and why are you giving up the drink? Why aren't you coming out? And I was, I was, I was a party animal. I was like out there the whole time. I was probably the one person that was always out. But... I knew I had to, something had to change, and through Our Lady, I started. Somebody told me Tom paid a rosary once a day. I remember a lady told me to do that. I started doing that. I started going confession. Those things brought me back to the faith, and that's that's because because it's, it's obviously true, Christ obviously, but that's that's why and that's how I came to my faith. To be honest. No, yeah, I think there's some interesting points. You, I think it's an experience I'd say is common of many men in Ireland. Like what I see is we've said like it's true and when you when you go looking and you see that the, everything else is sort of in, no substance to it you realize this is true you can't but kind of almost you can't help yourself you cling to it i think a difficulty for most of us is many people aren't even seeking if they if they were even asking the questions then you could propose the answer and it'd be so obvious sort of nearly mm. but if people aren't even questioning and why aren't they questioning why aren't they sort of even asking because they're just swept up in as you're saying the ways of the world. It's just, they don't really even like kind of ponder what's the quite, is, it, is, there, is there an answer? Um, because they don't even think there's a question to be asked. Um, and certainly in Ireland, the big problem with that is the sort of what we call it the lad's culture, the lad culture. Mm. Um, come out on the beer, um, you know, work from Monday to Friday, go on, the, go on the tear on the weekend and sort of don't question beyond that point. You know, you're just looking from Monday to Friday to go out on the weekend. So I'm, I'm wondering how can a Catholic man, um, that, that culture seems to, 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 to suck in so much about Irish life. If you go to a wedding, your, your mate is getting married, you're going to the stag do. If you're a member of a GA club, there's drinks after the, you know, it's part of the GA scene. It's part of, if you're in university, it's part of the university scene. It's almost like you can't be in any section. If you're in work, your work colleagues are going out. Um, so, like, we still have to live in this Irish society. We can't sort of, sort of escape to Skellig Vickle as much as we might want to. How can you sort of, is there ways, or did you discover ways to na navigate that? Did you, did you have groups, certain groups you socialized with, or did you, could, was there ways of sort of setting limits? Because what the modern world does not recognize is, you don't recognize any limits. Hmm. Did, you, did you find a way of saying, well, 
go, I'll, I'll, I'll go this much or this far? For me, I, I, I pulled away, but I, I was living with two mates at the time, and uh, like, it was very, very much a drinking culture. But um, I just, what I used to kind of do with the drink, I knew I always had a, kind of bit, of a, pro, a little bit of a problem, but I used to always like, give it up for Lent or give it up mm. for a time. But then five weeks or whatever it was, I, you know, that was going to be a big session or something. So I just said, I have to just give it up and not put a time limit on it. So I started doing that. They started asking me questions, not questions going, just, you know, what's the story with you now? And I just, I just had to, I kind of didn't t say head on what I was doing. I just said, look, I just want to go off or whatever else and all. And then I moved out eventually, which was helpful as well. But I just didn't go. I talked to, I talked to a priest friend as well. He said, look, I said, I still have a weakness here. So I think if I go into this situation, it came, and I did fall mm. down. I did mm. go back into it. Mm and drink, and I drink to excess a little bit. But just over time, just, just stepping back over time, it just, I didn't question it so much after a while, they just said, that's Tom, he's a bit mad, but um, yeah, it just. When it is questioned by certain friends, yeah. was there somewhere else where you found support? Where, where, was there somewhere else, like you mentioned a priest friend okay to talk to, but just, you know, it's hard to do things alone, I think. Um, I, I pretty much it was, it, was, it was quite alone. Now I was praying, I was, I was, the, the rosary every day was helpful, and um, over the last few years, it was the pro-life campaign was really, that got me away from it. I actually thank the Lord, because I reckon that during that time, it was such a, I was putting stuff up on Facebook about pro-life stuff, and like, people didn't know what was going on, to be honest. And like, if I had to be out on the beer, I just, I, I remember one I did go out, um, and some lady kind of attacked me about it. But for, for, the, for the most part, I wasn't out. I think the Lord gave me that kind of, pulled me out because mm. there could have been it was quite divisive I got a right. bit of abuse online and stuff and all so there was no perfect answer there I just I just kept pulling away a little bit no, yeah. well, kept, it will be situation yeah, dependent yeah. I think but, yeah. I kept, inv kept involved in like whatsapps and stuff like that and if events came up I'd go or else um, lately like if when you have a girlfriend or a wife and all you can go I'll have to head off the missus has me the off missus. here or whatever a couple hours so you know yourself but there was no exact reason but just, I just had to pull away a little bit that's it really Advi any personal advice you might want to share with guys? Because um, it's a tricky thing to navigate, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd say kind of like, if you look at Ireland now, I mean, uh, I think one of the things you have to think about with the churches, I mean, uh, like, like Tom was saying, like, you have to have something else to go to. You know, you can't just say, no, I'm not going for pints. Um, you know, I'm just going to sit home and stare at the wall. Like, you know, you have to kind of, the church has to start kind of, I think, offering people something else because it takes like a really strong faith to have your whole life built around. I'm doing this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so if someone suggests pints to me, forget it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I think um, if we look at kind of like 100 years ago, it was a lot easier um, in some ways. In some ways, like you might have had some of the um, pioneer societies were maybe a bit more common, now I don't know, 100 years ago specifically, but you know what I mean? Mm. And even the wider culture and stuff. But I think if you look at it now, the alternative is sit at home, watch Netflix. I mean, that might be your only place to socialize is in, is in the pub and stuff. So I think in, in Ireland, I don't know, I, I do think that could be an avenue that the church is missing. And like some people are talking, you, Emmanuel, you mentioned like the book club earlier, you know? Yeah. Like we used, I know we used to have a book club with Father Column as well and we used to meet in the pub, you know? And it meant that if lads wanted to have a pint, you were getting that time in with other Catholic men, and then you were actually having a really good chat. Yeah. And you were kind of like, you know, I know the first time I went, I was like, gee, I don't know if I should order a pint here. And I, like, you know, and if someone else ordered one, I was like, yeah, I'll have one as well, please. And, <laughs> but I remember, the thing about it was though, you were kind of there having the pint and talk, and you were like, oh, you were kind of like, it's kind of, I actually think it's kind of a good thing for some of the older men then as well, that they get a chance to kind of model how to have a conversation over a pint like an old man. And some of the younger guys who were there were kind of like, oh, this is nice and civilized. You know, nobody's throwing anything at each other. And we're actually discussing something heavy and you're learning something and it's good. So um, I think something like that is a good model and it's a good positive thing, you know? And I think, um, that's the big thing. You have to give some, and someone an outlet for those energies because otherwise right. they're not going to go home, sit at the wall, and, and yes. not go, you know? So you have to kind of harness the, uh, 
right. the nature. There's the right way of doing it. I think that's like as important as the right way of doing it. Uh, I, found a, I found a quote from a, a, a famous Dominican Father McCabe who said that when it comes to eating and drinking, um, what we take and enjoy is what is sufficient for our health and for the entertainment of our friends. So he certainly wasn't advising that, you know, uh, everyone, you know, become a pioneer or something. There has to be some middle ground um, for most. And I think, you know, we're not asking, uh, we're there to be witnesses into our, if we're going to change our society, if it has gone, gotten, gone way out of the ballpark or something, well, it's not going to come back if we withdraw from it. Mm. We need to be witnesses into that culture. And so but, we need to go to the weddings and the, you know, the things. And, yeah, no, I think it's, it's a really, this is a really important topic because I think, you know, drinking, grog, whatever way people refer to it, you know, it's, it can be, when it's out of control, it's toxic, but equally there's this thing as well, I think we see it as men, that, that kind of macho thing, mm. oh yeah, as you, exactly what you said there, Brother Mary, that you work Monday to Friday and then you tank up and you say, oh, you know, when you're, you're blitzed and it's, it's, it's not healthy. So, but I think as Catholic men, yeah, I, you're right, we have to kind of take it with a scruff of the neck and say, yeah, well, look, we can come together. Yeah, you can have a pint, you can have, a, you can have, you can have this fellowship, you can enjoy it, but you can, you can set the example. Uh, and I do think, yeah, the book club is a good example, because like that, yeah, we had the same experience. Before COVID, we were meeting in the pub, and like that, you could see there was a kind of, a, you know, some lads were a little bit nervy shock, but actually they realized, you know what, it's nice to have a, you know, have a, because the company was good, and actually, we, we, we found that we naturally led to more conversation. It, became very, it wasn't a session, it was relaxed, because, because I do think, you know, we talk about being men here, we, we need fellowship. We need to come together. Mm. And uh, even, even the Roman legion, they, they never sent anybody out on their own. They had to go out in pairs. You know, they, they knew you, you, have to, you, you need to be together. And, um, and I think sometimes it can be a mistake. I think you, you mentioned the idea of withdrawal and, well, I'm going to be heroic here, mm. but actually, what are you doing? You know, it's, you're, it's not unlike the, the Buddhist model. You're kind of mm. just focused on yourself. And, you know, and I, I, I have found personally being in the legion because... I think it was that, that first night uh, when I went into the Morning Star Oratory, you know, I suddenly realized I'm in an, an all-male domain. And I, like I said, I'd never heard the rosary said like that. And it was, in a way, like it was, it was like being in a Sergio Leone movie, except they're all praying the rosary. And there's some serious scar tissue floating around that oratory. I said, these guys have stories. But that struck something with me, because I said I hadn't been exposed to that. And the more time I found I spent with legionaries, both men and women, but mainly the men, I realized that, well, there's a toughness to these guys. You know, they're, they're not hanging back. And yet there's also a camaraderie, you know. And I think that's very important because we, we need, it's like being on a team, but you, you need to stick together. And, um, and I think, look, the Legion is just one example, you know. Um, and you mentioned something very, very important, you know, that, you know, where you go to confession, that church, because I've gone there myself. And, and I, I like that. I have found the priests there, the way they speak to, speak to us in confession, especially as men. You know, you really are challenged, and in a in a good way, and they, they pick you up. You know, so yeah, I feel there, there's we. I think we need to be creative and courageous, and I think we need to not just go into the culture and say, right, I'll hold myself together here. Mm. But I think we we've got to we've got to pull pull our guys together. And if it's a book club, if it's you know maybe talking about certain you know movies that we enjoy, but, you know, kind of but promoting that, even even just doing work together, physical work, just say, we'll, we'll work together on this. And uh, I think, you know, iron with iron, we'll spark off each other, but we, we have to make that move. Uh, that certainly would be ways um, in which to still socialize as men, I, I agree, yeah. I, and there is a necessity for that. Um, but I certainly think there's also an element in which the reason why fellows go out and participate in the drunk, drinking culture or go out to the pub is, that's the place where you're to meet someone. That's the expectation now in Ireland, uh, or has long been maybe. Um, and that brings up another sort of related difficulty for Catholic men in Ireland. If, if you want to meet someone, where are you to do it now if you're not yeah. sort of in that culture? And yet at the same time, we also know that tied up with the whole drinking and uh, wild night culture has been like the obliteration of dating as a phenomenon. It's been replaced by um, the hookup culture and sort of meaningless, fleeting relationships. So I imagine it's quite a difficult environment in which to uh, find someone. Like, how is a Catholic man supposed to find, if you feel called to the vocation of marriage, 
what does that look like in modern Ireland? Um, do you have to be very intentional about going to certain social groups to meet people? Or do you have to spell out what you're looking for when you meet someone? Because I think in times gone by, there was just accepted cultural norms. We all kind of understood the purpose of dating. The purpose of dating was to meet someone with the possibility of getting married. Now, dating is, well, I don't know what it is. It's just sort of this, you meet me, we, we hook up, and then we don't talk to each other again. Right? So how do you sort of set your expectations, or is there a way of doing that? Is there, how do we help men find you know, a potential spouse? Or, um... Yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously hard. Like I, I spent years going to the pub trying to meet a, a woman, and I never actually met a woman to, to, to marry, I suppose, in a sense. And like, I actually went on Catholic match initially. Um, I, was, I was like purposely wanted to meet a Catholic woman. And it was true that I met that lady who told me you're, 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 you're not living or you can't receive the Lord. So it became much more purposeful and as far as understanding chastity, et cetera, et cetera. But ironically for me, it was actually getting involved in, um, I think the Lord's work, through the pro-life work, where I actually met my wife. We met actually going door to door, knocking on people's doors. What I, what I learned from my Catholic faith was that everything was, has such a purpose. Everything you do has to, you know, you're not just, like a lot of people go out there and we've probably all done it and you go out and meet a girl and see how it goes, you know, buy a house, see how that goes and so on, so on. But I said to, I said to my now wife after two weeks, I said to her, this is a bit mad, some people think it's crazy, but I said to her that I'm not, I, I'm actually purposely looking for a wife. And Eva still sometimes tells that to some of her pals who, like her workplace and all, they just, they, one girl, one girl, you know, has, has seen 18 of her friends get married, you know. So it's not really a thing. And I, like, well, I said to her, to straight, I said, look, so I, I, was, I was praying to the Lord, and the Lord, I felt the Lord had said to me, but that purposefulness, in a sense, that's even a word, but that just doesn't, it's not even a concept out there anymore. So for anyone who's Catholic, I think, these days, it is, it seems like a narrow pool, in a sense, but I think getting involved in something like the Legion, pro-life groups, wherever it may be, even in your church, local prayer groups and all, you know, you're going to meet people of similar mindsets. So I think it's probably the best way, I think. I think it's interesting what you said. That that was the question I sort of was wondering myself, was do you have to sort of spell it out? Because you say, it seems a bit funny, oh, I'm, I'm intending to get married, I'm looking to get married. I think in a previous era, that was just taken for granted. <laughs> you know, it was assumed, like, if you're dating, that's, that, that's yeah. what dating's about. Um, so, like, is that what's necessary now? We kind of have to, like, sort of, as we say, put our cards out there mm. and say, because people, uh, this is the weird, I don't think people know what they're looking for, what's, what's, what's the limit, so. It's not as strange as your wife may find the story now, is, it no, might be funny to tell, but. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's, it's that strange. It's not strange, but it's, it's, it's strange now, I suppose, right. in these times. It may be like, what's needed, I think. It yeah, big time, like, it's, it's just, you're talking about men being men, like, I, I look around and I see men going out and like, I used to work in the Vincent de Paul, and every, like, 99% of people we dealt with were, were single mothers. Like, and it's just like, what is going out there? Men are going out there, just, God bless, and then there's a child, and then they're gone, like, whatever else. And, and they talk about a lot these days about equality in the world, and, and they talk about, you know, I don't want to go too much into that, but, you know, from what I can see, men don't really, the equality for men, may, may, may on, the, on, the, on the outside world, maybe it's there, but, for any men I know, it's not as it's not as real as it, as it should be. That they're not they're not treating women mm. like we, we should be living up to women, but we're not. We're just not. I suppose, kind of, um, if you look at uh, yeah, as as Tom was saying there, like in terms of like Catholic young people getting to know each other, you know, um, the question is like if like Tom went to pro life group, you know? But I mean, most people, like, like when the referendum happened a few years ago, I didn't, um, I didn't volunteer with anything with it. Now, I took it very seriously. I was very involved with it. Like yourself, I was ranting on Facebook a lot and stuff, you know? I lost a lot of Facebook friends. But the thing is, about it is that I kind of, it just wasn't my thing to go do it, you know? Um, and I just kind of, now, not that I haven't got other things in it, but I kind of just look at, I see some people go to these um, groups
groups for young people in the church. And it's really easy for them and they love it. And they love mingling with other younger people and the whole lot. But some people don't. Some people don't actually, they want to, re relatively speaking, stay in their own group of friends. Mm. And I think that's kind of a real challenge that's going to be with us for a good long while that, well, the rest of the culture is not Catholic. You're going to still have a lot of people who are, um, they're Catholic and they're going to want to, like, be surrounded by groups of young people who are, you know, it should feel like you're going to U2000, whatever it is, mm. but um, I've just always found that it's, uh, those, those two worlds just feel so many, many miles apart, you know? And uh, I don't know how the church can, um, can help that. I don't know. I suppose, as, as the guys were saying, like you have groups like the Legion, where a lot of the work you're doing is in the world enough and um, that you're comfortable with it and that you really feel like um, you're making a good difference. So I just kind of always think to myself, I think the real challenge with it is that some people might think, well, if I'm going to this organization or whatever, I'm totally turning my back on the rest mm. of the world and I have mm. shut myself off, you know? Um, so I think that's kind of, I've always just kind of seen with a lot of groups for young people in the church, it's kind of hard to get the, um, the balance right that, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I remember someone once, I was surrounded by a group of people one day and they were, um, they were talking about a Catholic matchmaking service, you know? They were actually, they were non-Catholics. Mm. And they were kind of saying like, this is crazy. Like, I don't know how people could do it. And I, I had never heard of this organization. I said, well, how is it crazy? How is it different from a non-Catholic one? I don't understand mm. it, mm. you know? Anyway, when they stopped, they were like, well, yeah. And I was like, no one's asking you to join it, you know? Right, right. But I, the thing about it was, I still think that's kind of the problem is that people might think you're either one or in the other. other yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, um, it's not either or, it's both and. Sort of a, yeah, so know. I don't know. It's tricky at the minute in, in the world we're in. I don't know. It's... Um, yeah, just to I suppose, f follow on from uh, Tom and Stephen there, you know, I'm thinking, it's a, it's a great question, but uh, thinking myself, you know, the culture, and I remember having a conversation uh, earlier this year, just about this whole thing, you know, you talk about these false relationships, or this kind of lifestyle, and like I say, you know, I, I had drifted very far, and I'm looking, you know, to be honest, and it pains me to say it, but I probably took better care of my vinyl collection than I did of some of my relationships, why? Because that seemed to be the thing, that's cool thing to have. But thinking about it, you know, you know, I got to a point, it's a, listen, it's all about commitment. It's about committing. You know, it's about making a commitment. I think making, you know, listening to Tom, I mean, I, I found your story there about how you felt about Aoife. I feel that's heroically romantic. You know, it's, it's actually, it's powerful. But it's a commitment. And I think as men, you know, that we commit to the faith. And I suppose... You know, we had this wonderful experience earlier in the week, one of uh, a new legionary taking his promise. And it was, it was a moment, you know, because I said, this is a guy, we'd all watched him grow, and now he's taken the promise, and he, he was humbled. But I said, he's making a commitment. And I kind of feel that's where it starts, you know. Mm. But, uh, you, talk, you know, all of this thing, you talk about dating and trying to get it right, and, you know, but we're, we're made, you know, in a way to live in this world. There is a way to live in this world as Catholics. But... We, we, we have to, I think we have to begin by taking it seriously. And there has to be a commitment. I think, well, if we're, if we're sincere about marriage, if we're sincere about finding that woman, yeah, that I, th I think Our Lady, St. Joseph, you know, there's many ways to get to it, you know. And, um, but I, I think it has to be, as men, we, we have to make that decision. We have to decide, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm for this, you know. I hear you saying that we need to sort of, I think, Men is the head of the family. Take the lead. Yeah. Head of the family, our future head of the family. Because yeah. the way the world, it's just, it drifts. It drifts. Yeah. And I think it's a bit unfair on the women to expect them to maybe uh, take over that role. Like, I think men should step up to the plate, as we say. Because um, it's not equal, as you pointed out. It may, whatever the talk about equality, it's not when you get down to the... Yeah, and a lot of, a lot, I find a lot, a lot of times now it's that <clears throat> women are leading, leading a lot of things and they're... <clears throat> When I called to a couple of doors there a few years ago in the referendum, the man answered the door and said, um, turn around to the wife, how are we voting? Oh, this is where we're voting. Oh, that's where we're voting. And now I was like going, right. you know, that didn't seem manly to me, to be honest. Mm. Like, mm. So, yeah, I think there has to be some sort of change. But I think, there, there, I think though, as well, that 
we we don't need to be molly coddled, coddled, I don't mm. think. I think that what, what we spoke about at the first begin this talk was the truth of the Christian faith being true. And when you hear that truth, when that girl told me the truth, when the priest told me the truth, it radically changed me, like totally. Like I, 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 and I look back and I see how much I've changed, but only for hearing those words of truth, I could be still right. out in the pub every right. weekend, you know? I, think it was, I don't think anything, you can never go wrong by speaking the truth, I think. Mm. And being explicit, if necessary, at times with people. Maybe it ties together some of what we've been talking about in terms of like men uh, bonding and having places to share camaraderie and having role models. Um, I think in, in previous years, sports always played a big role for men in that as a way of being a part of something more, um, being a part of something that implodes discipline on you. I think one disadvantage of a lot of modern education we see is it's all about maybe more nurturing and coaxing and all this. Uh, previous models which imposed discipline, I think boys responded better to that. Um, and one of the few fields where we still see that in our society is sports. You don't cut, you don't cut it, you don't make the team, that's not good, at, uh, performance is not good. We still demand of boys and, and, and young men in, in, in sports. And so in that way, I think it's something we still want to be a part of as Catholic men. It's still a good environment, it can, or it has potential to be a good environment um, in which to develop some sort of what we might call manly virtue. But we also know that sports um, definitely pose a problem, I think, to a lot of, to living a good Catholic life. They interfere more and more with Sundays. They become like a pseudo-religion. Um, and then, as we were sort of saying earlier, the whole drink, drug, sexual promiscuity seems to sort of coexist with a lot of the, uh, the sports uh, clubs and things and, and can be a place where you're sucked into that. So is there a way in which we can still sort of, how can we still be involved in sports or is there a way of um, you know, uh, getting men in, and being in, in, in sports or taking the lead in sports or um, without being dragged into like maybe the worst sides of it? Um, there is obviously pitfalls, but you know, that discipline, I think it's in men to, be part of something. Um, I think they actually. I think we thrive in discipline. Um, it, like it keeps you out of trouble, obviously, in a certain respects. But there, there obviously is going to be that culture, and I suppose it's a tricky one to answer, brother, because it's 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 in some ways it's not a bad thing. You know, you go out for a couple of points, talk about mm -hmm. the match. Mm -hmm. I used to love that to be honest. Like, like it, but it's it's that thing to excess, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And it's hopefully having those role models within within teams. Um, and I think a lot of, I think like the likes of being watching like professional football, like I suppose, even though Roy Keane is a decisive, decisive figure, but you see our Alex Ferguson looking back at those football clubs, uh, they totally got rid of all the drink culture across England, totally. And they're all like role models now and all. So there is definitely, I think sport is a good avenue for nurturing young men again, but it's a little tricky question to, mm. you know, it's... You need kind of a couple of, if you had a couple of good characters in the dressing room, it could help, but um, I find it a little tricky, but... Um, I can kind yeah. of hinge on who's, 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 as you say, in the dressing room, yeah, or who's, that's, yeah. who's the coach, yeah. Mm. Just to share an example, there was a soccer coach in our area, and I'd say, you mentioned this guy's name, and every boy knows him, and they'll always say, well, what do you remember about him? Well, he always, he always asked us to pray before every game, I'd say this man, you know, a bit of a legend actually, because he has a couple of Ireland caps, right? But he'd be very clear, he'd be very direct. He'd just say, "This is this is this is this is I owe all of this to my faith, all the things that I've achieved." And he'd say the story, and I realise now he was a bit of a lighthouse, you know, because mm. you know, because I could see, you know, I mean, the thing happens when boys go from sort of primary school. They're very, you know, they're very much focused. They have a lot of respect, you know, but that can, that can drift away very quickly as teenagers and get very turbulent. But I remember this guy, you know, and he's still alive, but not, not as active now in coaching as he was. But that was, that, I felt that was, he, he had decided this is going to be his ministry, you know, and it was that one thing and, you know, encouraging the boys to pray and, and kind of identifying himself. Now, this is, this is what I do and I'm happy about it. And he'd always make time to talk to them and, and constantly encouraging them. You know, we talk about men doing more and maybe, maybe that's something, getting involved in coaching, maybe seeing an opportunity, because we're, you know, it's clearly we're identifying that there's a, there's a, there is a crisis out there. Do we start, do we start sports clubs? Do we, do we get involved in leading boys 
and just like that, and maybe gently encouraging them in and around the faith. And, and there, are, there are examples, there are coaches, there are professional managers around the world who are clearly quite you know, open about their faith. And that has to, maybe we have, need to try and connect those dots, but it's just, he, he just came into my head there, I just thought I'd share that. It's a very good example, because I think when sometimes we say, what, what, what do I need to do to be a Catholic man in Ireland today? And we say, do I, do I go to the church, do I start going to um, Dominic Street to join the Dominicans for morning and evening prayer? Or do I need to say rosaries at the you know, statue? Or do I need to go to door to door, right to life? Sure, all wonderful and good things. But I think sometimes we, 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 we sort of project out these sort of more extraordinary examples. Yeah. When we're asking men to be, is to be an intentional Catholic as a coach in your local GAA club. Yeah. And which means, and maybe like you started saying, just saying a prayer at the beginning and end. When you know that God, you'll, you'll hear the talk, I'm sure, in, in the dressing room of the session at the weekend or something, not to be afraid to call fellas out. Yeah. And just say, like, is that really what you want to be doing? Is that really what you want? That's what being a Catholic man, I think, in Ireland is today. Um, it's not always the sort of uh, uh, standing up, uh, to losing friends on Facebook because of what you're posting about the right to life movement or something. Um, yeah, it's a good example. Yeah, and I know sometimes as Catholics, I mean, you know, I just think of that movie, The Mission, we're probably lo looking for something epic, but you're not going to find it. Maybe it's going to be in the daily grind. It's an offering yourself in there, in those small, humble tasks but there could be tremendous, tremendous fruit to be won from that. Maybe just to, to wrap up, would you have any uh, comments you'd like to make? What, what would you like to say to a young Catholic man in Ireland today? Is there anything in particular that, um, to encourage him, to, to call him, you know, as we sort of say, like our Lord calling the apostles, call him out. What words do you think from your own experience maybe, or maybe what was said to you that you feel you'd like to? Look at where you are. You know, look at the history of Ireland. Like we were talking about sport there, and you you wouldn't have the GA, let's say, in the in all of its positive aspects, were it not for the involvement of of, of Catholics, of of bishops, of priests in the eighteen hundreds, and they they put things on the they looked at the the higher order of things, and they wanted the GA to serve a better purpose. Mm. You know, so I say to people, if you're living in Ireland today. Look to those people who went before you, like Frank Duff, like the people in the GA, and say to yourself, this, this is who I am. This is the lineage that I'm in. Mm. And read into them. And people, I think, I know myself personally, when I start reading those guys, or, or even just about their lives, and looking around me at, I mean, you could find, I found, like even during lockdown, you saw pictures of people at Mass Rocks and things like that. And, you know, one of the reasons I mentioned Pierce and Plunkett earlier was that, you know, whatever people think of their lives, faith was still a big, important part of it, you know? So I say that to Irish men today, just say to yourself, you know, how can you, how can you disown this? How can you disown this past, this history? And I think it'll enrich you one way or another if you look into it a bit more deeply. I think you'll understand yourself a bit better if you look into it. Absolutely spot on, uh, Stephen. I think, I think for any young people out there today, you know, to take stock, you know, our DNA, you know, Celtic Christians, it's such a rich DNA. If we look at everything that's gone ahead, you know, before us, Skellig Michael, the heroic example of those, those warrior monks, you know, you, 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 you drive anywhere in this country and you're, you're, you immediately, just in the place names, in our, you know, our beautiful, beautiful Gaelic language, you know, it's, it's a sacred language. It's there, but it needs to be discovered. And I, I was thinking there about uh, Roger Book, um, and you know his move to Ireland, you know, because he felt, you know, the, the embers of the faith are still here. Now they are embers, but I think that's. I think young people need to. It's bizarre, but yeah, probably to look a little bit into the into the, our history, mm. capture that, get secure in that, and realise, hang on, you know, the church has gone through many periods of crisis. There's been many battles, and if anything, you know. Ireland has been in the vanguard, you know, in terms of its missionary movement and in keeping the faith alive. So, yeah, we are, yeah, we, it's a, as you say, the storm is crashing, as it has been for a number of decades. But equally, and this, this is a point to bear in mind, this could be very exciting. You know, this, this could be, hang on a second, you know, this could be a courageous time. And, that's, and, and then, as much as we talk about being soldiers for Mary, being soldiers out there, 
there's an excitement. You know, that, mm. listen, you're getting into a battle here, mm. right? And that's, that's an opportunity, right? That's a unique opportunity. And maybe we need to encourage that as well and uh, be creative, be courageous. So to look at that, but I do think, yeah, you're absolutely spot on, I think. And a lot of that now, a lot of our history has been airbrushed. You know, mm. they, now, like even when we think about like 1916, you know, the rosary was continuously being prayed where the ammunition was being handed out. But nobody, you won't learn that. You have to go and find that. And those guys going to Dominic Street Church before they, they went off in their campaign or making sure calling for the last rites. But the, all of that is kind of subtly cut out, right? But that, their Holocaust is kind of, you know, it's overlooked because they were very serious, serious about the Republic, but serious about their faith. Right. Look, there's elements there, I think, but young people today, we, you know, Mull and Oiga, definitely. So if we're in this position, I think we, we, we've got to get out there. I think we have to create opportunities, right, for them to come together. I really do think this is, this, this is the work. Even for guys who are not fathers, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a call to be a father in some other capacity, you know? So I just, over to you, Tom. Um, I'd say, um just maybe just best luck. Um, I'd say, like, obviously try and persevere. Um, and, yeah, keep striving. And, like, God bless was obviously fantastic. If you actually look back, there's unbelievable role models. You have the, the 1916 Rising. Um, not, not everyone's going to have to do that and all. Um, there's obviously the saints. and read into it, question things on, in society. When I was doing some evangelization, evangelization there a couple of years ago in Donegal, I, I, the one thing I was saying to a lot of lads was that, you know, question things, don't believe everything everything you, you see and, and hear, but also the fact that, you know, look to the Lord, like, and look, and look at those things every day as well, that look, you can, like, you can be, you know, in your own life, at home with your wife, with your, with your parish or your local community, little small things of just giving yourself, like, it's a total sacrifice of self, that's what we're called to do. And that is true, I think we're true, heroism is, and I think that men want to be, I think we want to be like soldiers. I think we want to be men and we want to like, you know, I think it's in us, like, like it's in our bones and just be a man. And uh, yeah, best of luck, I suppose. Great. All right, thanks. Actually, if I just add, just on a practical note, I would encourage any young person, join the Legion, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. <laughs> don't want to miss that especially in, the, especially in the centenary year. Yeah. Yes. Most definitely. Well, we were saying that what, what boys and young men most need um, are uh, models to look up to. So they found three here at any rate, so I'm very grateful for you for your willingness um, to come up and, and share your own experiences and your own thoughts. It's not always the easiest thing to do. So your willingness to put yourself out there uh, is not only it's an example of what exactly what we're speaking about. Um, so I'm very much grateful and thank you. Declan. I'm just going to say um, a word of thanks just before we wrap up, if that's okay. We're going to finish with the closing prayers now in a second. A great evening. I know we've gone on a little bit maybe over time, so thanks for everyone for staying with us um, in the room. Stephen's talk there, the poetry, the sense of sacrifice, then into St. Joseph, a um, bit of more poetry, the prayers whose sheet comes forth as morning rising, fair as the moon, bright as the sun, terrible as an army set in battle array, like battle array is kind of sets out a tone, doesn't it? So I think that this idea of fellowship, just being manly, as Tom said, to man up, is important. And, you know, where have the laymen gone? So there's a few here tonight, which is great to see. Um, but I think tapping into the Irish spirituality, like no other country went out and saved the fate in... Um, Europe, only for these Irish monks. And I want to read something here from Frank Duff. This spirit is there, it's alive, it's in, it's in the Irish people, but we have to bring it out. And I suppose we have to harness it and we have to kind of applaud it as well. So I think today, for the first time, we've heard about our different saints and maybe even for some of the, you know, the, the revisionists, shall we say, talk with the East Horizon and you wouldn't know whether you, you should be proud or not proud of it. But as Emmanuel said, they made that sacrifice. But even before then, um, in the 5th and the 6th and the 7th century, with the Irish monks that sailed, left Ireland, and um, they took on this huge kind of um, endeavour. And Frank Duff writes about it here, I'm going to read it in a second, but really what it was about was seeking out souls. They knew that to get a soul, 
a priceless soul, as Frank Duff would call it, that was going to get a lot of effort. And I suppose grace follows effort, but we need to have action as well, and that's what the I suppose that's what the lesion is about, what this what this this moment is about. It is a centenary year, this building here, the legion functioned and started in a hundred years, and we see the envoy, the walls there at the back of all the people who were um who went out to different parts of the world as well. We actually have Mary in the room here. She's on the wall. Like, I mean, it's uh, four or five years in Africa. Um, an Irish woman left the civil service and went out then to kind of adventure for Christ. So that spirit is there. Don't let the mainstream media knock it out of you. Harness it. You know, pray to your saint. Pray to Irish saints in your area. If, you don't, if you're not named after an Irish saint, maybe pass through, I know, near Columbanus or Columkill or... Gubnet and all these different saints that are out there. We don't even know how to pronounce their names nearly anymore. But I mean, look for their intercession, look for their guidance. Um, commend everybody involved this evening, particularly the committee, uh, Sean, Stephen, um, Brother Bruno Mary as well for keeping us going. I think we've planned for maybe three or four more, trying to keep the fellowship. So we'll be back to you. Big, big thanks to Mary Henning and her team. Um, Macleod of Productions. I know they have a bit of work to do in the editing, but I'm here all day, so I think you should put your hands together and give them a warm um, <laughs> applause. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila, uh, Gary and Mary, genuinely, for putting all this together. Um, I'm going to finish on this quote, if that's okay. It's Frank Duff talking about the a kind of missionary movement that was started in the 19... Um, 1960s, okay. During the summer of this year, 1963, Irish men and women sacrificed their hard earned holidays and devoted their time and their money to working for the church in Great Britain. They were ordinary people. In fact, people from every walk of life. They were members of the Legion of Mary, volunteers in a movement called Pergonatio Pro Cristo, Adventuring for Christ. Peregrinatio Pro Christo was the slogan of the early Irish monks of the 5th and the 6th and the 7th centuries. The passion to journey to spread the faith was the spirit. Columkill to Iona, Merua to Apple Cross, Columbanus to Italy and Gaul to Switzerland. Finbar, Canis, Brendan and so many others, all filled with this overpowering restlessness. These apostolic ones faced pathless ways, uncharted seas, and all the terrors of the unknown. Their spirit was akin to that of St. Paul. They were hungry for souls and deliberately sought hardships, knowing that souls must be bought at a price. Their minds were coloured with the idea of going out and facing all sorts of situations and dangers in order to bring souls to Christ. Nothing was allowed to stand in the way of determination and dedication. Quote from St. Bernard. There issued forth from Ireland a torrent of holy men and women which spread across the face of Europe, unquote. As a result of their great efforts, a great portion of Europe was brought into the church. So maybe we just ask for the intercession of these wonderful saints to bring a great kind of torrent of effort for our own Irish church because at the end of the day, we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have everything here. We've been given everything that we need to do to change the country. So we just ask them, I suppose, in these final prayers, I'll hand over to Brother Bruno now and to bring their kind of power, I suppose, into the room and to guide us in our journey for Irish men and women and for our country. Thanks again. We'll just conclude now by turning to Our Lady with the concluding prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we fly to your patronage, your Holy Mother of God, despising our prayers and our necessities, but ever deliver us from all dangers, O glorious and blessed Virgin. Mary Immaculate, Mediatrix of all graces. Saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. All you heavenly powers, Mary's legion of angels. Saint John the Baptist. Saints Peter and Paul. Confer, O Lord, on us who serve beneath the standard of Mary that fullness of faith in you and trust in her to which it is given to conquer the world 
grant us a lively faith animated by charity, which will enable us to perform all our actions from the motive of pure love of you, and ever to see you and serve you in our neighbor, a faith firm and immovable as a rock, through which we shall rest tranquil and steadfast amid the crosses, toils, and disappointments of life, a courageous faith which will inspire us to undertake and carry out without hesitation great things for your glory and for the salvation of souls, a faith which will be our legion's pillar of fire to lead us forth united, to kindle everywhere the fires of divine love, to enlighten those who are in darkness and in the shadow of death, to inflame those who are lukewarm, to bring back life to those who are dead in sin, and which will guide our own feet in the way of peace, so that the battle of life over, our legion may reassemble without the loss of anyone. In the kingdom of your love and glory, amen. And may the souls of our departed legionaries and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. And we'll just say the prayer for the beatification of the servant of God, that great Irishman, Frank Duff. God our Father, you inspired your servant Frank Duff with profound insight into the mystery of your church, the body of Christ, and of the place of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in this mystery, in his immense desire to share this insight with others, and in feel dependence on Mary, he formed her legion to be a sign of her maternal love for the world, and a means of enlisting all her children in the church's evangelizing work. We thank you, Father, for the graces conferred on him, and for the benefits accruing to the church for his courageous and shining faith. With confidence we beg you that through his intercession you grant the petition we lay before you. Tonight we pray in a special way that through Frank Duff's intercession we will see the re-evangelization of men in Ireland, that they will step up to the plate and follow in his example. We ask too that if it be in accordance with your will, the holiness of his life may be acknowledged by the church for the glory of your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.